Hello, everyone. Today, I have another wonderful person that I would like to introduce to you, Professor Ron Beghetto. Professor Ron is an internationally recognized scholar of human creativity. He serves as a professor in uh, the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. In 2018, Ron received the Rudolf Arnheim Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity, and the Arts. One thing which I like most about Ron is that he is a proficient writer. Ron, you have written you have written 14 published books according to my own counting, and you have three forthcoming books: one on uncertainty, uncertainty and design. The second one you co-author with uh, Vlad Glavanu on Codagogies of the Possible. And the third one you co-author with Maciej Karpowski on Creative Agency Unbound. It's fascinating. <laughs> so, Ron, how yes. did you get interested in creativity? Well, thank you first, Juana, for having me. And hello, everyone. So I, I was first interested in creativity uh, I started out, before I became an educational psychologist, I started as a classroom teacher. And I had a group of students uh, approach me and wanted me to coach them in something called Odyssey of the Mind. I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> they said, well, it's a creative problem solving uh, kind of after school competition. And I said, well, you know, I know nothing about creative problem solving. <laughs> but they were so excited. I've never seen them so motivated. You know, they were students that I had taught and they were never this motivated when I was teaching them. So I said, OK, um, even though I don't know anything and you should probably try to find somebody else who knows something about it, they said, we nobody wants to do it. So I said, OK, I'll do it. because You're so excited. And what happened was it was a really interesting structured program in creative problem solving. And it really required me to kind of step out of the teacher role and be much more supportive of their ideas. And I was absolutely stunned and amazed at the ideas these students were able to produce. And they won uh, the championship for our state in the United States. And we went to compete in the world finals, which was really just in the United States, but you know. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, and I became coach of the year for our state, but it was all the students. And it actually created an existential crisis in me. And I was thinking, how could it be that this same group of students, this same teacher, the same classroom could be so magical with ideas and actionable ideas after school, but during the day, you know, they're basically almost asleep. They're like zombies in my class. What is happening in school that we can't be having this kind of really um, engaging imaginative and creative work. What are we doing in school? Why can't we be doing this during the, the eight hours of school instead of just an hour after school? And so it really created really an existential crisis in me, a crisis of meaning. So that's when I decided to go back and try to study creativity in education, which was almost an impossible thing at that point. You know, I think, you know, creativity has come in waves. And so I finally found uh, Jonathan Plucker, Indiana University, who was studying creativity. There was really only a handful of people uh, outside of gifted ed that were doing creativity work. Because I wanted, I didn't want it just to be in gifted education. I wanted it because I saw it being so powerful for all students. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started my journey. And that's, I just started kind of exploring that. And then I started realizing more about, you know, creativity had played an important role in my life growing up. My father was a jeweler. I'm a first generation college student, but I saw a lot of creativity in like my father's work. He was an inventor. He had some patents, mm -hmm. um, but I also saw his creativity stifled and I just saw it in kind of the everyday work. My other side of the family had a restaurant and I could just see, oh, wow, creativity is just part of learning and life. Mm -hmm. And so this is really something that I wanted to learn more about and try to help support in the everyday classroom, but also outside of the classroom mm -hmm. across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. So that's how I was interested. It was just very, um, I won't even say maybe serendipitous, but it was just uh, almost random. I don't, you know, I kind of stumbled into it. Mm -hmm. 
That's that's amazing that that uh, you had no clue what creative problem solving is, and yet <laughs> you say yes to the challenge, and and then you you took those kids, and then they managed to to win the competition. And um, I, I was just wondering what what exactly changed, you know, like how did you from being a classroom teacher to being the coach of those kids, you know, like what changed in you? What what you know, how did you like lead yourself to, you know, make the leap between these two roles? Yeah. So I think what, um, and I've seen this also in working with adults. So I do a lot of work with adults as well um, in, you know, formal and informal educational settings. I think it's really a shift in the psychological environment was really important. That's why I really, it's really understanding. Plus also a shift in my kind of assumed role Mm -hmm. I was also a partner in learning mm -hmm. as much as I was kind of a facilitator or a coach mm -hmm. because it was new to me. So I was very kind of open to, okay, well, let's explore it. So mm -hmm. it was much more about possibility thinking, much mm -hmm. more about, well, what if you tried this? And I provided mm -hmm. feedback, but it was really student driven. And then I could provide kind of timely support. Mm -hmm. So it really was a kind of a co-constructive mm -hmm. process. And I think that was the difference. School mm -hmm. was very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do. And this is how you need to do mm -hmm. it. So it was all predetermined. That's how teaching, you know, typically is done in school, which kind of engineers creativity out of that space. Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't mean creativity doesn't exist there. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's not space or time for it often. Whereas this was really a, uh, much more about exploring possibilities and testing mm -hmm. them out, rapid prototyping of ideas, mm -hmm. working with, um, you know, a pretty diverse group of ideas that the students were generating, and then just kind of learning with them and just exploring, you know, these different possibilities. So that was it, it was a, a complete, because it wasn't a shift in the physical environment. Mm -hmm. It were the same people. It was kind of a, a shift in the psychological environment that was mm -hmm. created and a shift in my role, um, my own self-perceived role, but also how the students perceived me because they knew that we were all <laughs> learning together. So yeah. it wasn't like I had the answers. Mm -hmm. um, it was very exploratory, which was great. Yeah, and, and another thing that I noticed here, and, and I'm thinking that uh, uh, those kids chose you for a reason. Uh, probably <laughs> they could have chosen other teachers, right? So uh, other than, you know, having this... Um, like a uh, free choice of the topic and and uh, having this psychological safety and exploratory mindset there was probably also some better connection with you i don't know i'm just saying yeah it's possible i mean i think they did ask some other people and they the other people didn't want to do it um but i was just kind of open to it just because i saw that enthusiasm which also helped me start developing my interest in creative self-beliefs because what i saw was you know, there was so much uncertainty about what this was all about. But as students started developing their confidence mm -hmm. and seeing the value in what they were doing and being willing to take the risk. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of self-beliefs that um, I study with my colleagues. You know, can I do this? Mm -hmm. Should I do this? Will I do it? Mm -hmm. I was also seeing that in myself. I was also experiencing that. I was seeing my own confidence as kind of a facilitator of this process grow. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the value in what the students were doing. And I was also um, seeing the importance of taking the risk and just not trying to tell them what to do, but to step back and let them mm -hmm. try things out, to rapidly prototype ideas, to to kind of fail quickly and learn from those and kind of um, shift and try something new. Mm -hmm. So those, those are all early things um, that I didn't know at the time, but in retrospect are, you know, a large portion of what my work has been about and, and what I see in the field of creativity studies. And if we fast forward in time to today, when you have the forthcoming book on uncertainty and design, I read a bit uh, the description and, and you say that the book is, is uh, meant for teacher or other educators or like leaders of uh, um, educational uh, groups. Uh, and uh, the book is for these people to help the other young people to learn how to approach, approach uncertainty. And I'm really curious, uh, could you please give us um, yeah. one actionable <laughs> principle of how could we approach as a concept uncertainty and how we can like apply it in, in, in the lives of, of uh, uh, students or even adults that we are working with in learning environments? 
Absolutely. So yeah, that book is informed by those early experiences. And then just my other experiences, I was prior to joining Arizona State University, I was the director of Innovation House at um, the University of Connecticut. So working with college age students, but also working with adults. So it's, this is about whenever you design any kind of learning experience, it could be a corporate learning experience, it could be in higher education, it could be in K-12. It's really when you're trying to design a learning experience. And I think the key argument and insight that I've developed in my work is when we typically try to educate people, um, and this it kind of brings in the possible and, and different futures, we're trying to prepare them for uh, the likely future, the foreseeable future, because the future is so uncertain. So that's where the uncertainty comes in. And so one way we kind of make a, a, a kind of bargain with the future, if you will this kind mm -hmm. of pedagogical bargain. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes call it a Faustian pedagogical bargain because I think we're shortchanging ourselves and the, and the students we're working with, whether they're young people or whether they're adults. And so what we tend to do because the certain is unknown is we base it on what we already know and we think, mm -hmm. okay, well, this group is likely gonna need to know these things, which is fine. I mean, I think that's that's obviously an important part of preparing anyone for future work or future learning or future experiences, but we stop there. And what I'm inviting people to do is realize that if we can move into the broader range of uncertainty and move into possible futures, so there's not one future, what if we expand it beyond just, this is what you likely will need in the foreseeable future and start thinking about broader arrays of the future and start thinking about what if we also prepared you to develop your comfort and confidence navigating uncertainties that you're going to encounter? Mm -hmm. So learning how to learn, mm -hmm. learning how to develop your creative agency mm -hmm. so that when you experience something new that you haven't been taught before, that you can start approaching that and thinking through, is there a way to structure this uncertainty? So the mm -hmm. actual I idea is how can we help young people or anybody that's learning structure the uncertainty they're facing when they're facing complex learning challenges or ill-defined problems. Mm -hmm. Those are all filled with uncertainty. So they're not predetermined. There's not a predetermined answer. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not even a predetermined process for solving those necessarily. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What happens when young people or anyone faces a problem where their typical ways of thinking, reasoning, and acting no longer work? Because mm -hmm it's so new or things have changed so radically, that's when you actually need to be creative. That's when you need to think in new and different ways. If there's already a tried and true way and it's very efficient, then just do that. But in cases where that no longer works or you wanna create something new, you have to think in new and different ways. And so that's what um, uncertainty by design is about. How can we prepare people to step into that creative reasoning and creative sense-making by structuring the uncertainty so that they can start moving into it and designing something new and testing it out. And then again, it's this iterative process of generating possibilities, testing them out mm -hmm. and trying to resolve that uncertainty. And, and you know that can be transformative to your own learning. It can create new products. It can create, um, for some of my innovation house students, a, a new company, you can start a new company or it could just solve a very complex problem. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we spend sufficient time at all Mm -hmm. in formal educational spaces, preparing anyone to um, see uncertainty as an opportunity mm -hmm. for new thought and action, mm -hmm. and even transformative thought and action. Yeah, it, it's really brilliant. And um, I hope that um, like some kind of uh, uncertainty management uh, courses will be introduced in like education from K to 12 till uh, till university and uh, if I think about for instance uh, my own experience uh, with the, how I met uncertainty um, yeah. you know like I went through school I, I graduated from university and not for one second I thought about uncertainty until I had to decide to you know like uh, get a job <laughs> Yeah. And and then I was like, oh goodness, what am I gonna do now? You know, like uh, yeah, and and I managed to to find a solution, but uh, with lots of panic, with lots of stress. So it would be great if we could find a way, and your book uh, will 
give some answers to that, how we can uh, introduce the experience of uncertainty and the ability to manage it at an earlier age so that it's, you know, you know, like it's, you don't get so uh, worked out <laughs> uh, when you are 20, 20 something. Yes. And I think part of it is starting with, so, you know, this book, you know, reflects some of my other work, which is the idea that we tend to over plan and over structure learning experiences. So everything's predetermined in advance. And again, sometimes that's necessary and important. However, you know, even starting with a lesson that you know doesn't work or the students don't respond to it well, what if you started removing some of the predetermined elements and added some to be determined elements? So you introduce uncertainty into an otherwise structured and supportive mm -hmm. learning experience. That's kind of what those kids did in that early creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. So you start saying, okay, here's the problem that you want to solve. That might be predetermined, but the way you solve it is going to be entirely up to you. So maybe you teach one process for solving it, but say, mm -hmm. I want you to come up with different ways of solving that. You can do that in any subject area, math, literature, but it could also be problems that students identify. And as you start doing that work, then it really is about having students identify problems that they want to solve that maybe nobody else even sees as a problem. Mm -hmm. And having them really work through that problem finding and problem defining and identification mm -hmm. phase. So when I was um, directing Innovation House, we only spent a couple of weeks on that the first year, but we realized in the second year, we need to spend an entire 15 weeks on problem finding because mm -hmm. students, most of the students had never in their entire lives been asked to identify a problem mm -hmm. that they want to solve that maybe even other people don't see as a problem. Mm -hmm. And then actually have an opportunity to, to solve it or create something new. Mm -hmm. And so it took them a long time to understand what, how do you even find a problem we're solving? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And is that really a problem? So sometimes students would say, well, I want to create an app. It's like, okay, well, an app might be a solution to it. What's the problem the app is going to solve? Mm -hmm. So it took a long time helping you know, college students, mm -hmm. um, and they were from all different majors. Uh, they, from everything, from engineering to the arts, some of them hadn't decided what they want to be, but they all were involved in this kind of phase. And we realized it took, you know, we spent an entire 15 weeks on problem finding, mm -hmm. then working towards, okay, what are you going to do about it? Who do you need mm -hmm. to partner with that has expertise that you may not have yet? That So that's another stopping point. In school, it's usually, well, you know, you identified a problem, but you don't know how to do that yet. So you're going to have to wait until someday to solve it. Well, you know, as we're doing right now, there's experts all over the world that you can Zoom with mm -hmm. and connect with. And a lot of folks want to support young people who are enthusiastic about trying to solve a complex problem. Mm -hmm. So they can learn how to partner with expertise that they do not yet have and move forward in addressing that problem. So I think, again, those are very actionable things. And they're things that for some reason, we just you know tell students someday. It's like this promissory mm -hmm. note. If you learn this stuff now, then someday you're going to get to use it. So what if we did both and, you know, you're going to learn some things that you may use someday, but mm -hmm. can you try learning how to work through complex problems now and develop your confidence and competence mm -hmm. doing so, even though you may not yet have the domain expertise, there are people that could support you through this process. And I think that's powerful learning. That's very transformative when that happens. Indeed. So being confident in, in, in face of uncertainty and uh, being confident in your ability to find a problem that would be interesting for others people to, to hear the solutions. And if we um, uh, focus a bit now on your uh, research uh, work on the contribution that you have brought to the field, uh, to the domain of creativity, what would you say that it's one major, let's say, um, heritage that you leave behind? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a difficult question to answer because I think that's usually determined by other people and <laughs> not necessarily myself. I mean, I think some of the things that um, folks have responded to well is, you know, some of the work I've done with James Kaufman and as we're trying to conceptualize like our 4C model of creativity, where, where it really part of that model really started from uh, my own understanding that anytime somebody engages in learning, so the definition of creativity, generating something novel and meaningful or useful, mm -hmm. right? So using that, um, you could see that anytime somebody has a an experience that they 
realize is new to them and it's personally meaningful and transformative to them, even if it's not new to anyone else, that's still mm -hmm. under the definition should count as creativity. Mm -hmm. So that's mini C creativity. Mm -hmm. And then we start talking about like, okay, when there's external audiences that recognize that, like, oh, what you did there was pretty interesting. That's a pretty mm -hmm. um, important thing that you've done in the context of this classroom or in the context of this company, even though, again, it might not lead to a revolutionary mm -hmm. new product or experts might not see it as, as something revolutionary in the everyday context, that still can be the case. Mm -hmm. And then we move to the next level, which is professional level creativity, where experts in a field recognize like, wow, that's a, that is a contribution to our field. Right. So, and again, kids can do that when they partner with other experts. They usually don't have the domain knowledge. It does require domain expertise, but it doesn't mean you can't connect students with domain experts. And then there's, you know, legendary creativity that's bestowed on people after they're dead. So that's that's a model. So some of the theoretical, the ways we've thought about creativity, and then my work with my colleagues on creative self-beliefs and creative agency. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a, I just have lived the importance of that. And so doing work and trying to understand how can we, look at this in a much more dynamic way rather than just give a static scale and say you know how confident are you in doing this which is where i started and others but moving to a much more dynamic understanding of that realizing that when somebody's presented with a problem they're even though they might have a high level of confidence in creatively solving problems a particular problem in a particular moment they may not may feel very low confidence and their confidence is very dynamic as they're moving through the process of trying to solve a problem including when they feel like they've hit their threshold and they can't go any further. You know, how can they find supports from others? Can that support their confidence? So I think those kinds of um, creative self-beliefs that I mentioned earlier, you know, can I do this? Should I do this? Will I do this? That's, you know, creative mm -hmm. confidence, that's creative value, and that's creative risk-taking. Mm -hmm. Those three beliefs are something that I've really been focusing on um, and looking at those dynamically, both from a research angle, how do you measure those more dynamically? But from a practical applied effort, how can you support those three beliefs and help people move through the mm -hmm. uncertainty towards creative resolution? Yeah, I I, I love this uh, 4C model um, because it's like helping um, the way I feel about it. It helps people uh understand better the way they relate to creativity and not feel intimidated by the legendary creativity the big yes. c creativity the genius type of creativity <laughs> and this mini c creativity is really like at the heart of everybody's uh let's say life design you know creativity is us our mind our bodies and and the way we navigate through life this is the mini c creativity and i find your model very liberating in order to face and cope with the uncertainty of of life yeah and, and i think you know yeah. again it's you know that model those ideas are inspired by earlier work as well i think we were able to put it together in a way that um at, i guess just during the time it, it, it kind of caught people's attention and made sense in the way we kind of organized it but I think a lot of people have recognized um, in the field that, yes, there are these different kinds of experience of creativity. And we we kind of describe it as a developmental progression, although you don't have to necessarily. I mean, you could just have your own creative experiences. And so some of the work I've done with Vlad on, on talking about the creative experience, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to lead to something that other mm -hmm. people recognize, but it could still be meaningful and beneficial to your own experience. And then I think in education in particular, Typically, you're working in the mini C, little C. You're helping um, whoever they are, young people or adult learners, express their ideas and make their own meaning. That's what learning's about. So learning and creativity are very kind of interrelated. So I've done a lot of work on creative learning. But the creative component of learning is when you're doing something that's new and meaningful to yourself, but also that when you share that out, it could benefit the learning and lives of others in the classroom and in beyond the classroom. And so that I think that that 4C model does help think about what are we trying to do here in the classroom? We're usually trying to get young people to have confidence in their own ideas and then to express, to take the risk of sharing those. Because when they do that, it could benefit the learning of other students, but also benefit the learning of the educator themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then maybe even push it beyond the walls of the classroom. And it could maybe make a pro C contribution, you never know, right? So I think, 
that model can be helpful in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, as I said, uh, I, I love this mini C uh, conceptualization <laughs> of uh, creative experiences, our everyday lives, because um, I believe that uh, this, the, the, some people talk about the simple joys of life. This is the creative experience, the way we, um, we behave in a classroom, the way we have confidence in, in uh, speaking out what we, what we think, the way we uh, feel when we come to, I don't know, at home and, and, you know, in the home environment. Uh, uh, so this is all mini, this mini C creative experiences, which is a shame that I think we've been blind to them. And, and yeah. I hope that more people open their eyes and, and find their way to, to have these creative experiences. Yeah. And have the courage to share those ideas and, and be open to the feedback also. So I think part of it also starts speaking towards, so when I, in my models of creative learning is really, there is a responsibility on the part of the people in the learning environment to support each other in developing their own ideas. But there's also a responsibility on the part of individuals to share ideas that can contribute to others. So it goes beyond just the self. Mm -hmm. So if you have an idea that can actually help somebody else in that space or can mm -hmm. solve a problem in your environment, then there is kind of a creative responsibility to share that and, and yeah. to get feedback on it and to be open to that feedback so that other people can understand it and that it can actually turn into something that could be potentially transformative. So it's that kind of both end, the mini C plus the expression of it and the development of that into sometimes everyday or larger contrib creative contributions. And you mentioned some <laughs> keyword uh, feedback, and I know why yeah. feedback makes me think <laughs> of failure. I have no idea. <laughs> but you have another intriguing title of the book, which is uh, called My Favorite Failure. And, um, you know, like we, we have you know, you, I, and li our listeners uh, probably have heard a lot about how to cope with fa uh, failure, um, that that failure is teaching us lessons. Um, but but I would, I don't know, like, I feel that um, the truth is that that um, feedback, especially when it's not as we desire, hurts yeah, in the first yeah. part. And one thing that I don't know. Do you when you talk about my favorite failure in, in this book, um, you also mentioned about the fact that um, we may benefit from understanding the experience of failure. Would you like to elaborate more on this? Yeah. So again, you know, some of this is from my own kind of experiences, um, both personally and as an educator, and and just and just seeing people trying things out. So I have another concept that I've developed that I call creative mortification. So this is an idea where somebody's developing their creative identity in any domain. It could be dance, it could be science, it could be writing, it could be it could be any domain, sport. And so as there's they they move from like, oh, that's kind of interesting to I like poetry to maybe I could write a poem. Mm -hmm. And as they're starting to develop their confidence and maybe they're getting feedback like, oh, that was a nice poem. Keep writing, keep writing. And so they start and so they're moving from I like poetry to I, I want to start writing poetry to starting to see themselves as a poet. Mm -hmm. So these are very kind of potentially fragile moments, mm -hmm. right? So the feedback yeah. they receive, especially when they have a negative performance outcome, it can be stifling. I don't believe creativity mm -hmm. can be killed. As long as you're alive, <laughs> you can always be creative <laughs> and you can be creative. Creativity thrives in constraints and there are always constraints. So even in the most kind of suppressive space there's still creativity creativity still possible however that said i think particularly when somebody's kind of early on in developing their creative identity in a particular aspiration or domain if they experience a negative performance outcome a just fancy word for failure right <laughs> if they feel shamed in that moment shame is such a mm -hmm. powerful yeah. personal emotion yeah and they somehow get the message that they can't get any better right that you're never going to be mm. john keats or mm. or whoever your emily dickens whoever your poet favorite poet is or whatever the case may be but they also experience shame that that kind of coupling mm. of you're not going to you can't get any better and um you experience that profoundly negative emotion of shame mm. so many folks 
put the poetry pin down and never pick it up again. Mm-hmm. Hang up the dance shoes, never put them back on. Close the science book and do something else. Quit the sport team. And so the idea is like, that's a huge creative loss for the mean, for the, for the same idea that you mentioned earlier, because there's so much benefit in still expressing yourself creatively in domain, even if you don't rise to the levels of a professional or, you know, some legendary poet or something like that, there's still value in that work. The problem is the trying to return to it can be so personally painful and be seen as an exercise in futility that many people just abandon it. That's why I call it creative mortification. It's a temporary, indefinite suspension of creative of pursuing a creative aspiration. Mm-hmm. So I think as just humans, we have a responsibility to try to understand how we might support people in still finding some mm-hmm. sort of creative outlet. You know, maybe helping them adjust mm-hmm. their goals, or mm-hmm. in the feedback that we're giving, making sure that we're still honest with our feedback, mm-hmm. but we're not delivering feedback that's received in such a way where people feel like they can't get better at this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that they feel shamed by it. So that book is kind of an outgrowth of that. My colleague, Laura McBain, who's at Stanford D school. So she does a lot of design work in education. And again, whenever you're doing something new, right, new and different creative, uh, the chances are it's going to not work out, right? I mean, it's probably more likely that an initial idea is not Mm going to work uh, than, um, if you keep persisting and trying to find different ways or thinking about the problem different ways. So it does require some sort of persistence as you're hitting setbacks. And so that book is really, we made that title intentionally provocative, my favorite failure, just to put a positive, um, you know, kind of term in front of a seemingly negative term of failure. And what we did is we invited people to tell stories of their favorite failures. And we invite everyone that's working with, um, colleagues or young people or adult students to when you're doing something that's going to take risks what if you started by sharing some favorite failures of your own Mm -hmm. so what were you trying to do what happened and most importantly what did you feel when it happened so be Mm -hmm. honest about how terrible and painful failure is Mm -hmm. failure is not a fun experience Mm -hmm. i think these slogans of fail fast and fail forward or learn from your mistakes are great until you're in the emotional throes of a really painful failure. So I think it's about acknowledging the emotional valence that's there and how it's a full body experience. And then the next questions are, what did you learn about that experience? And what did you learn about yourself? So it becomes a learning moment, even, and albeit a sometimes very painful one, learning can still happen. So we were just in dialogue with these. So people submitted these narratives. Then we were in dialogue with each other and and these narratives and talking about these experiences of failure and what can be learned from them, even though they might be potentially painful, but how learning and growth can still happen if we're very honest and open about it. And Mm -hmm. if we start out, if we allow it in those spaces like a classroom and say, you know, for example, could you imagine a, a math teacher starting the year saying, let me tell you about one of my favorite failures in mathematics? Because mm-hmm. a lot of students have a very negative relationship with math. Some students love it. Other students don't. So if you're asking students to take any kind of learning risk, what if you started with sharing your own favorite failure mm-hmm. so that they know that, OK, if I fail in this class, it's going to be OK. We're going to support each other through this. It might yeah. still be terrible and I may not mm-hmm. like it, but mm-hmm. I can still learn and grow from it. So that's what that book's about. But it really is on my end of that really came out of kind of my work in thinking about creative mortification and how terrible of a loss that is when people stop pursuing creative aspirations. Mm-hmm. So it's really about that. You And you never hear those stories. You only hear the stories about, you know, the people that have broke through and they, they defied the crowd, you know, like, yeah. You know, all these different, you don't hear the stories of people that just stopped pursuing. And if you, if you, I, it's, I usually do this at like dinner parties. Some people don't necessarily like it, but, or in a large group, how many people have experienced creative mortification? And there's usually at least a third of people in that space. And then how many people know of somebody else who's experienced it? And then that number goes up. It, and, you know, and some people haven't experienced that. Um, but I think it's a real phenomenon that we mm-hmm. should really think about and be conscious of and try to work through uh, it, you know, try to prevent it in the first place by doing things like 
the favorite failure exercise. But then when it does happen, trying to support people to find some creative outlet, mm -hmm. outlet. Because I think the research is pretty clear at the mini C and little C level, at least if you have some sort of creative aspiration, it can bring meaning to your life. Yeah. And so why yeah. shut that part of exactly. yourself off? Yeah. So we, we are too focused on achieving uh, when we think about creativity. And and uh, actually, I found myself in uh, your concept of creative mortification. And I even write about it in, in my own book. But for instance, it's like I... I love the math, but then just because one teacher happened to say that I'm not really good enough for math, I chose not to continue and, yeah, and yeah. I chose another path. So I had to hit my head against the man, against many walls. I didn't have mm. the supportive people in my environment to guide me to find another creative outlet. I thought that I'm good for nothing in general. So yes, I lived with creative mortification for many, many years until I found the, the psychology of creativity. Yeah. Yes. And so I think just another point on that, I know we're kind of spending a lot of time, on, but I think it's really important. I think that's the really kind of um, intriguing and kind of almost frightening component of it is that you can be going along, developing your confidence, getting a lot of positive feedback along the way. And in one instant, it's over. You yeah, stop. Exactly. You know, I mean, that happened to me with writing poetry. I, I share that story in some of my other writings too. It happens to people and they may not even be aware of it. And then there's also these inter interesting kind of counter narratives where you know, there's examples of people that receive very honest and difficult to hear feedback, but the person providing it says, now let me sit down with you and show you how to improve. Mm -hmm. That little yes. teeny tiny move can make all the difference. Yes. Right. Yes. At least anecdotally in these narratives that, that I've looked at, you know, even in kind of professional um, people kind of re reflect on their lives. They can tell those stories that, yeah, it was hurtful, but the thing about it was that feedback I received from that mentor actually helped me grow and realize yeah. I could get better, yeah. even though I wasn't quite there yet. Yeah. But yeah. so it's that simple thing. It's usually, you know, and it might be a, an educator, a parent or a friend could say something. They're just being on that you want the honest feedback, but they don't think to then say, well, here's some suggestions for how you might improve. Yeah, so it and could that's be one... well intended. But, yes. You know. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's one thing that that the the, the mm, harsh feedback um, comes from a good place with intention to you know like okay if you're not good in math or in writing poetry then you might as well go and uh, put bricks on top of each other. So uh, it can come from this uh, good intention to direct the person to a better fit of like uh, with their skills, but then. Can it be also that some people who give harsh feedback, they are wrong? You know, yeah, of like course. that's the thing. We're foreclosing on possible. If we think so, you know, my most recent work really focused on the possible and AI, but I don't know if we'll get to that today. But I think it does foreclose on the possible. We don't know because the, the future is not known yet. There are futures. There's multiple possible future trajectories. So even though this person may not be at that level yet, we don't know through persistence or supports you don't know what's possible so it's mm. it's hard it's very difficult and i think potentially dangerous to foreclose mm. on a student say there's no way you can do this yeah. i mean there are stories of people that have defied that mm. right there are some people that are actually mo they hear that and they're like oh really i'm gonna mm. prove you wrong mm. right but that requires <laughs> that requires a lot of kind of uh really robust self-confidence yeah. Yeah. yeah um that some people might not have as, as particularly if they're early on in developing their identity around that so again, this this isn't just a phenomenon that happens to kids. It can happen in the workplace. It can a supervisor telling an employee or a supervisee, and you know, and they're just receiving it in that way. And there's no guidance for how to get better. I think just by saying, "Let me show you how to get better," it it tacitly says you can get better, and it takes it can transform that mm -hmm. shame potentially into just an embarrassment mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. a painful hurt, but it's not debilitating like shame can be. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I'm glad we're spending a little time on this because I think it's something we just gloss over sometimes and think about like, yeah, you know, I mean, think about how many people sing, you know, everyone, kids in school singing and dancing and drawing. How many people are still singing and dancing and drawing? Those listening, if you are, congratulations. I don't sing in public. I dance sometimes, 
Um, I don't draw and, and you know, <laughs> but I used to love that as a kid. A lot of kids do, right? So what happens? Oh, I can I can name the moments when I stopped doing that. When I was told by a, <laughs> a choir teacher just to mouth the words and let everyone else sing. <laughs> so things like that was just it. Okay, I've done. I guess that's that's not for me. And that brings me again to this creative experience. So what we cannot draw like with talent? So what we cannot sing with talent? And actually, I'm um, I'm teaching a course on creativity here at the Helsinki University for doctoral students. And I took uh, one year. I took them to a drawing class. I really suck at drawing, but my point was to show to my students that creativity is not only about an artistic talent. Creativity is about a type of thinking. It's a versatile resource. And if we want to achieve to get to that pro C level, yes, we have to be more aware of which is the dimension of creativity. Is it like singing, writing, or um, drawing that you want to focus on? But otherwise, if you want to have uh, uh, to enjoy your life, go for creative experiences. Sing, not only in the shower, just sing with your friends, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think that's the important thing. You may not be able to achieve at a professional level, but if you still enjoy it, you know, that it can have value for you, right? And and the, and the, even if you're never going to reach the professional level, you can still get better, right? Exactly. I mean, that's the learning yes. component, yes. right? Yeah. It's not like you're stuck at that level forever. You can get better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least potential, the possibility of getting better, I think, is is kind of what education is all about anyway, is there is a kind of a fundamental assumption that change can happen because learning is change, but so is creativity. And therefore, you can improve. It may again, it may not be to the level that anyone else recognizes as like, oh my gosh, you know, we need to create a gallery uh, of your work for you. <laughs> but you can still find meaning out of it. You can yeah. still find enjoyment, and maybe people in your everyday environment can. So I think, again, we we are too quick to hang, to kind of step away from it, and I think we're too okay with people just stopping a pursuit that they found enjoyable mm. and meaningful. Yeah, that's true. But one thing we it's good <laughs> to be quick at is what I saw you at the, um, the conference on uh, Possibility Studies Network in Dublin. You're very quick in adapting your presentation to um, AI technologies and you talked about the use of AI. And uh, I, I would really want to hear from you because also on your website, you say that one of your um, themes you are interested in is, and I quote, principled approach to using AI as a possibility thinking partner. So I'd like to, to talk now in the end of our, yes, of of our interview. First of all, what is possibility thinking? Okay, so yes, let's unpack that. And that is what I've been spending my most time on is, is possibility thinking and using AI as a partner in it and approaching it in a principled way. So possibility thinking, um, it has a long tradition in creativity studies. You know, Anna Kraft and her colleagues did a lot of work out of the UK, for example. The way I think about possibility thinking is I call it pragmatic um, kind of uh, imagination, if you will. So you're not only generating new ideas imaginatively, imaginatively so mm -hmm. pragmatic mm -hmm. prospection, you're kind of mm -hmm. throwing out these pr possibilities. If you just leave it at that, it's just an exercise in imagination. So the pragmatic component of possibility thinking is you're doing it within an effort to try to put those ideas into action. Mm -hmm. So it's a key component of creative thought and action mm -hmm. is generating possibilities, but trying to find actionable possibilities that can help you produce something new, produce something meaningful, solve a problem, work through uncertainty. So that's possibility thinking, generating multiple possibilities, this kind of imaginative work, mm -hmm. but then testing those out and narrowing those down and refining those and constantly trying to find those that are most actionable mm -hmm. and reasonable for whatever you're trying to do. So that's possibility thinking. It's a very generative process, but it has a very pragmatic component to it. Now, the principled component of that is we can generate possibilities that are actionable and put those into play. Um, and they may we might think that was a cool thing that I did, or I really like that, but it can have negative unintended consequences on oneself or others. So the, the kind of principled component of this is to always think about, don't, but don't let this stifle you from engaging in possibility thinking. 
but to be aware of. So possibility thinking is what if thinking. The principled component of it is what if not. So what if I generate this possibility and I put it into action? Before you do that, the invitation is to engage in what if not thinking. That's the principal part. Mm -hmm. What if this doesn't work? Mm -hmm. What if this is not a good solution? What if it actually causes harm mm -hmm. to others? So to kind of bring in that kind of principled or ethical lens mm -hmm. and to recognize that, you know, whenever we put something new in the world, there are going to be unintended consequences and mm -hmm. potential side effects. Mm -hmm. And so to anticipate those and think about how can I monitor this mm -hmm. to make sure that what I think is going to help other people isn't actually harming them. Mm -hmm. I think there's plenty of cases in the world that we can all draw on and point to when you're just engaged in generating possibilities that are actionable and doing something new and have no regard for the potential side effects that can be highly problematic. Mm -hmm. So part of that work, and we, you know, we started some of that work at Innovation House, and I've kind of done more of that here at ASU. That's one of our des uh, design aspirations at the entire university: mm -hmm. principled innovation. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of early in kind of helping develop some of that thinking around that. So that's that's what that is about: principled possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, what I think is really absolutely interesting important, and I think there are cautions about this as well, but I see great potential in this age of AI, in these generative large language models and all this generative AI, that AI is, uh, can actually serve as a partner in possibility thinking. You can actually train these models or steer these models to use possibility thinking protocols that I've developed and other people have developed as a partner in possibility thinking, like you would with another human. But the beauty of AI right. is it never laughs at your ideas. It mm -hmm. never gets tired. It will continually generate possibilities. It will also help you engage in what if not thinking, mm -hmm. coming up with the counterfactuals, helping you mm -hmm. think through some consequences that you might miss. So you can actually use it as a partner in possibility thinking at three o'clock in the morning when everyone's asleep, but you're you know, on fire with ideas and you want mm -hmm. to kind of, in, you want that feedback. So it can give you that feedback and again, it's about using AI not for answers, but for generating possibilities. So it's mm -hmm. still very human centric. It's human creativity times AI. The human is still central. And from the start throughout to the end, you still have to make judgments about what AI is generating. Because again, even if you agree and the AI says this is a viable solution, you still have to think about in a mm -hmm. principled way, well, what if we actually implement this and actual humans um, mm -hmm. don't benefit from mm -hmm. it, but they're actually harmed from these ideas. Or if it doesn't work out, what can we do? Or if this is not actually a problem, but setting that aside and thinking about what a powerful age we live in now where we can partner with generative AI and it can be a very compelling and I think in many cases viable model mm -hmm. or partner in possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where my work is going. I've developed a lot of tools to demonstrate kind of this proof of concept. And I've been presenting on those, refining, and I'm going to start doing research on those tools as well. It's very inspiring to listen to you. For me, chat GPT is like, uh, I'll never feel lonely again. Um, <laughs> and and I wanted to ask you, um, from your experience of in uh, like uh, having um, chat GPT as a partner of conversation, what would you say that, were some, let's say, conversation skills or like thinking skills that you had to learn? Because it's not like uh, the two of us are now talking. It's not like human-to-human -human communication, right? Yeah, I think you have to provide. So the models I've been using, you can actually um, provide some steering towards them. So you teach them uh, these principles and these protocols and say, when I ask you a question, you're going to use mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. principles to respond. So mm -hmm. you'll respond with like the stem of what if. And then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when I ask, okay, what are some things that might go wrong? You'll use what if not. So I talk about, I, I have protocols in my new book, Uncertainty by Design, and I have AI example walkthroughs of these different mm -hmm. protocols. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's very dialogic. It's not a search engine. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for answers. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it becomes a problem. When people treat it as a search engine for answers mm -hmm. we know that they those models hallucinate mm -hmm. um, and can provide and make things up but when we're talking about kind of this pragmatic prospection or pragmatic imaginative possibility thinking it's okay if they hallucinate <laughs> because those hallucinations might actually mm -hmm. have something in them right so it's yeah. it's okay 
So if you use it as kind of generating possibilities that may or may not be practical or beneficial, then I think you're in a better space with that. So I think it's it's a shift in mindset mm -hmm. that you're, first of all, you have to kind of give some parameters and some constraints to that model. So it's not just, you're not just asking it questions and it's responding, but you're actually structuring the way that it responds. You're, you're requesting and prompting it to respond in a very kind of specific way that can support possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. So helping you generate multiple possibilities, but also help you generate um, different ways of seeing those possibilities as well as those counterfactuals. And so I have a whole host of these kind of possibility thinking protocols. Um, again, they're in the book and I'm developing these models. I'm, I'm hoping to post some of these videos on my website that show, that demonstrate how you can use this as a partner in possibility thinking. But it does, it requires you to be very clear and precise in your prompting. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, it's a very iterative process. You sometimes have to nudge these models. It'll say, well, I, I don't know if I can do that. And you say, yes, you can do that. You know, it's, uh, it is a dialogue back and forth. Um, it's very interesting. And it just, it's kind of like writing. The reason why I write so much is because it helps structure my thinking. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of interactions can also help structure our thinking around yeah. generating actionable possibilities. Yeah. And also considering the consequences of doing so. I hope we are going to talk in another interview about uh, <laughs> the next stages of, of using AI. Now, when is your book going to be published? It's going to come answer? out either October or November, depending. And where? October or November. Cambridge University Press. Okay. And the last question, Ron, and then <laughs> we are ending this very, very interesting interview. So get it's still about... AI, our partner in crime. So if <laughs> AI can create images, it, it can compose music, it can write stories, it can produce knowledge, what does it tell about human creativity? What what are we gonna do? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about it is it, it can be problematic if we defer our agency, our creative agency to AI. So I think there is some concern when, you know, particularly young people that are still developing their confidence and confidence, if they're just asking AI to do something for them, then they're not really using it as a partner in possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. I think when you engage with it, you, sh you are still the one kind of leading the creativity. But if we, if we think about like, you know, mini C creativity, if creativity is really a judgment that's usually made after the fact. So creativity is really, if we think about it as a judgment based mm -hmm. on this definition, then yes, the, the things that AI can produce could be judged by somebody as both new and meaningful, mm -hmm. i.e. creative. Mm -hmm. However, it's still the responsibility of the human to kind of facilitate that interaction and then do something with mm -hmm. that. So it's mm -hmm. still, I think there's still, it still has to be led with the human. Otherwise, I think you could potentially, especially if you're a young person, defer your creative agency and feel like I can't be creative, but this tool can be creative for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a potential danger that I think is very real that we should yeah. think carefully about. So we want to make sure we're using it as a partner in possibility thinking, mm -hmm. just like you would another human. I mean, I think that's another thing to think about, not that it has the same capabilities as a human, but if you have a young person that's working with somebody else, who's giving them all the answers, if they're looking for answers, we know this from group work mm -hmm. in any educational environment. When you work in a group, there's always going to be a cut, one or two people that does all the work and everyone else is kind of a freeloader in the group. That's the biggest complaint of students or anyone that's worked in groups. And so it really is about how do you still maintain your agency and responsibility mm -hmm. as a human creative being when you're interacting with other people in groups? Because it could still happen in groups. Kids working in groups with more skilled peers can just say, I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to have them do it for me. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to do this, mm -hmm. right? So a skilled educator has to say, no, you have to, look, this is part mm -hmm. of what, this is part of the expectation. You know, yes, you can work with this person, but how about what are, what are your ideas? What's your contribution? Mm -hmm. Same thing with AI. I think you have to approach it in that way and help young people learn how to approach it in that way mm -hmm. so that they don't become dependent mm -hmm. on this for something that they're trying to cultivate in themselves, their own creative identity. 
So let's uh, think of AI as a partner that helps us structure better our thoughts and uh, helps us uh, still have joy and meaning, meaning while we are yes. involved in creative projects, <laughs> generating ideas. Absolutely. Ron, thank you so very much. Uh, one last comment is um, if, if our listeners want to reach out to you, where can they find you? So um, you can go to my website, which is just www.ronaldbaghetto.com. It might be in your show notes. I don't know. Um, and there, there's a contact form and you can kind of see some of my work. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Juana, for this opportunity. It's, it's been a really interesting conversation. So I thank hope you so very I much your for your viewers time. find it interesting as well. I, and I was maintain, very inspired. <laughs> and let's maintain the human in creativity and um, let's take those creative risks and develop our creative confidence in ourselves and others. Cheers to creative confidence. All right.